Ron. Hi guys, this is Jojo from SC2 News and this is episode 3 of In the Spotlight, the new StarCraft 2 live show every Monday, where we talk to players, industry insiders and lots of other interesting StarCraft 2 personalities. Um, remember, you can ask our guest questions live in the chat and I'll pick some of them out. Um, but before we start, I'm really honored um, to announce my guest today. It's no other than actor, entertainer, comedian, voice actor, Neil Kaplan, um, who might be known to you guys as the voice of Tychus J. Finlay. Okay, I really can't do this. Um, Neil, maybe you introduce yourself and maybe your Tychus is a little bit better than mine. Um, hopefully at this point my Tychus is better than everyone's, but you know, we'll just leave it at that. I, I, I did actually go to YouTube once and found somebody taking a stab at it and um, uh, got, got a good laugh out of it. But uh, just to prove it to everybody, uh, this here is good old Tychus Finley. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. Um, um, I would, I'd like to start off um, a bit about your background. I mean, we had an interview about a year ago where we covered a lot of that. So I, I'll try yeah. to add a little bit of a different um, tone and maybe a different direction to it. Um, oh, good. I know, I know you grew up in California. Um, what was that like? Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, that that's hard to kind of hard to kind of explain because I had nothing else to uh, compare it to. Okay, maybe. Um, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I, I'll try to make it a bit more clear. Like, I mean, to to a lot of people, you know, California is this kind of image of, you know, beach, sun, you know, the American dream kind of thing. What were, you know, some positive and negative things in your well, in your youth? Or do you feel proud about being Californian and stuff like that? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm happy I've had the chance to uh, travel a little bit out of the country and, and see other parts of the world. But I know some Californians that have, like, never left the state. Um, you want to go skiing? The mountains are here. You want to go to the beach? The beach is right here. You want to go to Hollywood? It's right here. Disneyland. You want to get away from it all? Trust me, my wife and I almost disappeared off the face of the planet one night when we went driving and took a wrong turn. So although there are millions and millions and millions of people that live here, there's still plenty of wide open space. Um, you know, lots of nature. I, I, I grew up in the 70s, so I got to see Star Wars before it was called, uh, 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 what, what's, what's that, what's that title you kids have given it? I think A New Hope or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was one of those people that used to read Starlog and sent letters, handwritten letters, um, to Paramount asking for them to make the Star Trek movies. Um, you know, the 70s were certainly a different time, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to think of how, how did we ever figure out what was playing at the movies? How did anybody ever get a hold of us back then? We didn't even have answering machines. Oh my gosh. How did anything ever get done? <laughs> but, but some, somehow we managed to find our way through it, you know, um, yeah, I, 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 the only thing that I really put my finger on as far as being from California is I think for the most part it tended to make me dialect neutral. You know, my parents were uh, proud New Yorkers, so I had that New York influence in the house. But, you know, I didn't grow up talking like this, you know, and, and uh, getting into the whole old age sort of a sound. You know, and I certainly... Uh, the Valley Girl thing was uh, during my teenage years, but like, you know, I never started talking like this for sure, totally. Hey, that's totally weird, man. <laughs> you know, um, I think my my biggest thing that I picked up was, was using the phrase, you know, as a stall tactic when I'm trying to speak and figure out the words that I want to push through my mouth. You know, you just see right there, you know. <laughs> okay, uh, I, w I will look out for that during the interview. So oh no! Maybe I can catch you off guard, you know. Please don't. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so pretty much, it was beneficial for your voice acting career in a way that you are. I mean, you said um, you're dialect neutral. I, 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 you know, I, I think so. My, the thing that really started me off on my on my voiceover pursuits um, actually started when I was even younger, and we lived in Phoenix, Arizona. There and and. 
it had nothing to do with being in Phoenix, Arizona, but um, there was a there was a syndicated television show that starred only impressionists, people who did you know vocal impressions and stuff like that. Um, uh, an amazing woman named Marilyn Michaels and um, and Frank Gorshin, who a lot of people know as the Riddler from Batman back in the 60s with Adam West. A lot of people don't know that he was an amazing impressionist. And so I would watch this show and I always thought it was so neat and they do this one sketch every couple of weeks where all it was was celebrity sneezes. All right. So um, as tribute to Jeepers, my favorite movie star of the moment, Chris Rock, because of all the nice things he had to say about voice actors last night on the Oscars. Hey, thanks for the shout out, Chris. <laughs> Anyhow, um, but if I were to do his celebrity sneeze, it would be something like, Ha, 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 choo! I sneeze, did you hear? Ha, ha, choo! And that would be the whole thing, you know? <laughs> Uh, and so I just started picking that up and and somewhere along the lines I started doing a really bad Donald Duck it was you know kind of out of the back of the throat it was <laughs> and you know for a five year old that's adorable but for the older brothers of the five year old it was lame and they made sure to let me know that <laughs> well little did I know that somehow and I, I have no idea how but I actually stumbled on the way that Ducky Nash, the original Donald Duck, actually did the voice of Donald Duck. And it's this whole thing of putting your one side of your tongue against partially the soft palate and your gum line in the back. And basically, I would be to your mouth a totally different way. And I stumbled on it, and sure enough, that's how Ducky did it. So the next time I would do Celebrity Sneeze as Donald Duck would be, ah, 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 yeah. and that's how he actually did it. So it was like, oh, I guess I can do that. <laughs> and then it became, you know, like the eight-year-old doing impressions of, of Jimmy Carter and Jimmy Stewart and Kirk Douglas and old-time movie stars and, um, it, you know, I, I finally stumbled into children's musical theater my parents being from new york they were big fans of broadway so i guess i kind of picked up on that and um one night when we were doing a show raising money for the children's musical theater our special guest for that show was none other than mel blank dying you know and when you're a kid and you get the chance to meet your idol like that you hang on their every word and so when mel blank told me that impressions were for bad stand-up comedians and hacks, I took that to heart. And he said, if you really want to do this, if you really want to be in this industry, create original characters. Do original stuff. And trust me, original stuff can be based on bad impressions. You know? So, um, I took that to heart and, and paid more attention in my teenage years to to the sketch comedy work that was being done on Saturday Night Live and a show that was on for a couple of years called Fridays. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really what inspired me to create characters. And when I started doing work on stage, I naturally found that the first thing I would do when breaking down a character, creating a character, was decide on the sound. How did they sound? How did it come from? And everything else that I did was built on top of that. And I still, whenever I do something on stage, more often than not, um, that's kind of where I begin. All right. Is how is how is this character going to sound? And then that affects how does the the character stand? How does he sit? How does he feel? What's his attitude? What's his behavior? You know, I mean, eventually, by the time the curtain goes up, the voice may change, but that's because I started at point A with the voice, layered on a couple of other things, and said, aha, in order to make this work, let me alter this right here. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, a lot. Yeah. And right. actually, to touch upon that, um, one of my viewers um, asked earlier um, for you to explain a bit the differences between voice acting and television, film, and theater. Um, 
acting. And I mean, you touched a lot upon the similarities now. What are the, the main differences well, for you? Well, for a, a couple of years, I actually taught, um, I taught voiceover academically um, mm -hmm. at a performing arts college. Excuse me one second. Sorry about that. No problem. Anyway, so I, 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 I taught there, and one of the biggest things that I found with every single one of my students was I had to pull them back. These were people who studied theater and were, for lack of a better term, this is what I called myself, they were theater rats. So they were all about projecting to the back row of the house, being heard everywhere. And the thing that I had to tell them was, when you're doing voiceover, it's like you're talking into somebody's ear. And you certainly don't want somebody right in your ear talking nice and loud. <laughs> you know, and if you're going to do that, you back away from the mic. So when you're having a gentle conversation, like right now you and I are just chatting, so uh, I'm about an inch away from the mic. All right. You know? Okay, I mean, so if you, would, if you were to teach me right now, like, what am I doing wrong from what you can hear? Yeah, uh, that's the other thing is I'm not a big proponent of voiceover lessons via the internet. Okay. <laughs> because no, because for me, my philosophy is you're building a character, not a voice. And if I can't look at you and see how you're standing, how you're physically holding yourself, um, what you're doing with your face, are you smiling, are you not smiling, um, where are your eyes, where's your focus, then I don't think I can really coach you. I, I, I think I can give you tips, I can give you hints, but to really coach you, got to be there in the moment to, to, to see what you're doing and, and how it's happening. Right. It's, it's like trying to, trying to work with a violinist just by listening to them and not watching their bow technique mm -hmm. for, or, or anything along those lines. If I'm watching you and I can see that if you put less pressure on your index finger that you'll actually be able to play quicker and more, with more dexterity, I'm going to say that. All right. But if I listen and I, and, and I hear something off and I can't tell what it is, the visual thing is what's going to help me. Um, now, the other thing uh, with regards to the difference in acting style, I think was brilliantly pointed out by Trisha Helfer mm -hmm. back at BlizzCon 2009. Um, I'll explain this quickly. Trisha Helfer is the the voice actress or voice actor um, of Kerrigan. Exactly. Well, Kerrigan slash the Queen of Blades. Exactly. Queen of Blades, in, yeah. in Starcraft in, in Two. Wings of Liberty. Yeah. Um, I believe that she's continuing the role, and technically, that last scene she was Sarah, and she had that flashback scene where she did Sarah. So, in my in, in my view, she plays both characters. Mm -hmm. Um. But what she said at one point in time was she kind of turned to the rest of us and she said, I really admire what you guys do, um, which was great. It's always nice. Uh, uh, again, when we have these wonderful people like Mr. Rock, who kind of points out the inaccuracies of voice acting, it's kind of a bummer. But when you get people like Trish Helfer, who stumbles on it and explains it, with all earnestness, it's it's appreciated. And what she said was when she was doing episodes of Battlestar Galactica, regardless of the fact that there was a camera and a director and a crew where she could see them, out of her peripheral vision, she still saw the walls of the Battlestar. She still had the gun in her hands. Mm -hmm. May not actually fire bullets or lasers, but it... It's a gun, and it feels like a gun, and so you can grip it with your hands, you can shake it, you can hold it up and down, you know, all sorts of different things that can be done. And even in the scene, there will be the other actor that she's doing the scene with. Then she followed that up, uh, up saying, however, when I'm playing Kerrigan, I've got none of that. And that's really what it comes down to is when you're doing a movie, you've got the set, you've got the costumes, you've got the makeup. Um, there, was a, there was a pre oscar story that I saw on one of America's news channels recently 
that was talking about makeup, and they ha- they aged this um, reporter with realistic age makeup from, I guess, about 35 to 75. And when he was done and he was looking at himself in the mirror, he's sitting there saying, you know, I feel older. Why? Because he looks in the mirror and gets this realistic representation of what he'll look like. And he has that odd feeling on his face of new things that are there. So it's physically uncomfortable and now there's that recognition within his subconscious of oh yeah old well how does old feel oh and so all these physicalities and these emotions that are buried in there will actually tend to start to seep out a little bit so to me i say voiceover acting is is the closest thing to being a six-year-old other than being five (laughs) <laughs> and that is it's all about your imagination you know mm-hmm. when 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 a kid is five or six years old and he has a red towel around his neck adults actually have to tell him that he cannot fly okay yeah because otherwise he's got the cape he's superman right that's what he thinks and that's sure it's dangerous but um that's just powerful when it comes to what you can do with your imagination. Yeah. Um, and, and so, and so, to me, it's 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 more of the it's more use of that imagination. Yes, when you're on stage, you have to imagine that the audience isn't there, and yet while you're busy imagining that the audience isn't there, you've got to make sure that you stand the right way so that the audience who you're imagining isn't there can see you. Mm-hmm. All right. When you're doing a film, you've got to imagine that the scene that you haven't shot yet actually just happened since it's the previous scene in the script. Mm-hmm. So there's st- always imagination involved when, you, when, you're, when you're acting, just more so, in my opinion, when you're voice acting. All right. Um, yeah, touching up on that a little bit before you maybe, I don't know, move um, to StarCraft again, I'm, I would really like to know... Um, how much credibility? Uh, uh, how much credibility do voice actors have in Hollywood? In Hollywood, I mean, like, where where are they in the in the food chain? You know, is for example, um, you know, video game voice acting, um, is that seen as a viable medium like others, like um, it, movies, television? It, depe- it, it it depends who you talk to. Okay. It depends who you talk to. I mean, Jennifer Hale and Nolan North are, you know, if you talk to the right to the right people. They're two of the biggest actors in the world. And yet, if you talk to people who don't know their work, they've never heard of them. Mm-hmm. You know, but but Jennifer Hale's in, like, what, every other video game ever made? And Nolan North just has done a lot of video games and some really legendary work. Um, if you go to certain parts of the world and ask who Crispin Freeman is... They will freak out. He's such a huge star in the anime world. He also is a you know does plenty of animation work and video game work, but he's he's a supernova yeah. in, in, in the world of of, of anime. Um, I frequently will have discussions with other actors who may make their living as as extras. And they look at somebody like me as, you just read words off a piece of paper. That's not acting. And then a voice actor could turn around and say, yeah, you stand there in the background of a scene and nobody even knows you exist. How is that acting? It's, you know, it's, that's my least favorite part of this industry is when people's egos kind of get involved and they feel this need for one-upsmanship. Um, I've been told by more than one producer that currently um, the feeling in in the industry is that if they can't see you on stage or in a movie or in in on TV, actually mostly TV and film, if they can't see you act there, then they don't believe you can act. Mm-hmm. And we're talking about voiceover, so. There's a there's a current addiction in Hollywood to 
bringing in famous faces to provide voices. Now, I have no problem with with casting an actor who is well cast. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could you could spend the rest of your life searching all over the world, and you'll never find a voice actor who would have been better than James Earl Jones as Mufasa in Lion King. He was oh, yeah. brilliant. He was brilliant. Didn't bother me that I knew him from Field of Dreams or The Great White Hope because he was brilliant at this. It only bothers me when when it when the performance falls flat and it's just a case of they hired somebody because of their name. Yeah. Their experience or gee whiz, I've always wanted to meet this actor, you know. Um we we we'll, we'll for sake of argument because it's not possible, we'll say I've always wanted to meet Lloyd Bridges. So let's hire Lloyd Bridges to do a voice on our cartoon. So they hire Lloyd Bridges. Lloyd Bridges may may have been a wonderful television and film actor and in the right role may have provided a great voice. But let's say he goes in there and he's not comfortable with the situation and it just comes off flat. Well, the person who hired him doesn't care because they just wanted to meet and work with Lloyd Bridges. Yeah. You know, so... Um, it's um i i there i i certainly have plenty of people uh, you know in 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 town um and around the world who have expressed that they like my work and uh you know thanks to the internet box i've also heard from people who are not such big fans yeah it happens you know all right um and a viewer just asked um, to follow up with um, some, you know, you naming us some people um, who you would like to work with and why. So let's say three maximum. Um, gee whiz. Uh, well, let me name a couple of people that I have worked with that I was so glad I did. Um, Jim Cummings. Uh, I did a project for Disney with him, and that was just amazing. It was just he and I, and it was like, oh, my gosh, do you know who you are? I mean, he's 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 a deity in this industry, for crying out loud. And certainly working with Andrea Romano, who is arguably the number one director in voiceover, mm -hmm. um, working with her on StarCraft, that, that was amazing. Um, I've worked with Sue Blue. That was, that was a real kick in the pants. I really enjoyed that. Um, that being said, who would I, who would I like to work with? Um, it's really kind of tough. Um, I would just like to work. <laughs> okay. I would just like to, I would just like to work and I would like to work with, with good people. Um, I could very easily name off probably a list of a hundred people, many of whom I've already worked with and I just love being in the room with them. Um, and there are certainly people who I haven't worked with yet, um, like Gordon Hunt, who, you know, been in the industry a long time and I would love to, 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 to work with him and, and to, and to be directed by him. Mm -hmm. Uh, I certainly would love to work with the legendary Frank Welker. Um, and, you know, to be perfectly honest, the, the probably the one that leaps to mind when I talk long enough, Peter Cullen. I mean, for crying out loud, I've played three of his roles. I would just like to work with him. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'd love to work on, on Transformers Prime and playing a, a different Transformer and be in the room with Peter Cullen while he's playing Optimus Prime. For me, as an actor, as one of the four actors who played Optimus Prime, and in fact, the only American-born actor to play Optimus Prime. All right. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah! Kind of. I didn't even realize that for a while either. Um, I believe it's two Canadians, one Brit, and one American. So there you go. <laughs> okay. Um, maybe following up with um, working with Andrea Romano and just in general the work with Blizzard and the voice acting. Um, how, how did that work? What do I like? What do we have to think about when we when we think about okay, Andrea Romano? Directing was she there with you? you? Do, do, she... do you, do you here, here's an example of how amazing 
um, a director, uh, Andrea Romano is. Okay. Um, you've played the game. You you watched the cut sequences, right? Yep. Which scene do you think? Wh- or which scene or which scenes do you think I worked with, with Robert, and we were both in the same room at the same time recording? I mean, I I know the answer because I remember from our last interview. Um, but I would I would think you actually worked together. Yeah. No. We we were never. Never in the booth together. We crossed paths going in and out. I'd be done with the session. He'd be starting. He was done. I'd be starting. Um, so we'd we'd cross paths in the in the waiting room or in the lobby. We never once spent a single moment in the booth together. And yet I'll go back and I'll watch that stuff as as a discerning viewer. And it works for me. I mean, there's a relationship there. There's there's interplay going on there. And if the director is not on their game to make sure that we both understand the physical space that we're working in, because let's face it, if she records with, with Robert one week and then with me the next week and her direction for him is, okay, you're across the basketball court from Tychus Finley, and she tells me you're sitting down at the table with Jim. Yeah. That's not going to work. Because we'll be playing in two different spaces. The energy won't match up. It's like if you ever see a movie, an animated film. <coughs> excuse me. If you ever see an animated film and it just doesn't sound right, there's just a feeling that something's off. A lot of more, than likely, more than likely, that's a case of actors not working together and a director not moving them mm-hmm. into that same space for lack of a better term, Mm -hmm. you know, and and there was never that case with anything on, on Starcraft. So uh, Andrea was able to elicit emotions out of both of us to give us um, intentions, uh, motivations that would match up and make the, our two approaches work together. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it makes a lot of cool. sense. Cool, cool. Um, so, so how would that how would that look like? Let's say you 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 speak a line that's supposed to be in a conversation with Jim, for example, Jim Rayner, right? Um, and she doesn't like it. What does she tell you? How does how does that does that, how does that work? In it would you it would usually be just along the lines of you know let let's try that again, and if she has something specific in mind. Um, she would give it to me as a as a point of motivation, as a as a, as a point of of intention. I don't recall ever once getting a line reading from Andrea Romano, which is also another wonderful thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, line reading is when a director knows how they think they want to hear it, and so they'll act it out for you. And to a certain extent, it kind of, it's a little ego bruising. It's like, you don't trust me to get there. You don't think that if you tell me I should be upset, that I'll be able to achieve that. Um, and, and Andrea is, like I said, I don't think she ever gave me a line reading once. Mm-hmm. And that's certainly to her credit. And, and the, those those scenes work those scenes feel like like we're all in the same room at the same time yeah I and feeding that. off each other's uh um feeding off of each other's energy yeah it was a very it was a very um honest and straightforward experience as well which is not always the case in video games i mean it is you know it is it is a bit i don't know far away and it is um in a way, in a way, not as easy, you know, to to extend disbelief in in this kind of situation. But it it really felt like you know, a true epic saga, a true story you got really emerged in. Um, coming to to the script, maybe. Um, do you remember if there was you know lots of revision and were there lots of things dropped that you might have recorded? Like, do you do you remember a line that never made it to the game? No. Nope. No, no. I mean, basically, what ha- what you have to remember is when an actor does a play on stage, or they 
you know, when they when they do a play on stage, they memorize the entire script and they're doing it for weeks and they keep saying the same lines over and over and over again. Mm. When an actor films a scene, yes, they may memorize the, the, the dialogue overnight or over a couple of days. But then when prepping for another scene, that dialogue kind of gets pushed out as they remember some as they memorize something else. Mm-hmm. I walk in and read the words off the page. So there's usually almost no retention. Yeah. Especially when you're doing a video game where you're, you're recording by yourself. So it's not like you feed the line to somebody and they react to it. Or they make a joke out of it or anything like that. So there's n- nothing that, that I could remember. Um, I mean, there's, there's one line that stuck with me. And, of course, it, it made it into the game. Um, Go for it. <laughs> I made a deal with the devil, Jimmy. She does. I go free. I, mean, you know, you're talking about the, the penultimate moment of 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 that game. You're talking about the emotional fulfillment, and and really what we've all been waiting for. Yeah. And and. You know, it, it sticks with me now more because I've done a couple of conventions where we've shown that scene and talked about it. And like, for instance, I'm down in Brisbane, Australia in November watching that scene with Robert Clotworthy and it suddenly occurred to me a lot of different things about that scene, which I didn't even know at the time, but because my director was so good, she was able to work me through that um, that obstacle course get me where I needed to be, even though I didn't truly at the moment understand. Yeah, yeah. A- and that is, do you know why Tychus was shot? I mean, Jim is trying to save Kerrigan. Oh, the the, an- the answer from, the answer from a Tychus standpoint is yeah. Tychus let him. Tychus, Tychus let him shoot that gun because that's what needed to happen. Mm. You're talking about, I mean, this, this is a classic anti-hero. Yeah. yeah. This, is a, this is a guy who, who, much like Han Solo, just wants to sit at the bar and have a drink. That's it. Just wants to hang out with his friend, have a drink, tell a dirty joke, um, maybe get into a brawl, and then call it a night. And then somebody comes in through the door and talks about how the settlers are being wiped out or about how the empire is after uh, my friend or whatever it is. And both are the kinds of guys that sigh heavily, drink whatever's left in the glass, grabs their gun, <coughs> excuse me, and heads out to do what has to be done. Yeah. Now, that includes a certain moral code. And in Tychus's moral code, there's nowhere where it says anything about killing innocent people. Yeah. And so when he has this offer, um, to get out of his uh, his personal prison, out of his suit by um, by ridding the galaxy of the Queen of Blades and the destructive force of the Zerg, um, he's all for it. Why not? Okay, I can be a hero and get out of this suit. Cool, I'm all for it. He doesn't believe in any of this hocus pocus mumbo jumbo business about grabbing an artifact and turning a zerg into a person. So he'll just he'll use his friend to get where he needs to be and pull the trigger on a monster because ultimately his friend may be mad for a little bit, but ultimately he'll get over it. Yeah. He'll 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 be okay with it when the when there's no more war and, and the Zerg aren't destroying planets anymore, um, he may miss the cute redhead, but he'll understand she was gone a long time ago. And then they find themselves in this cave. And Tychus is looking, and he's not seeing a Zerg. 
he's seeing a woman. And he pretty much can't believe his eyes. Yeah. But that's a that's a person, and regardless of what you think about the Queen of Blades, the Queen of Blades is the one that caused the destruction, not Sarah Kerrigan. At least in his mind, in, in you know, from anyone's standpoint. Y- you know, you don't you hesitate before you shoot Dr. Jekyll if the only problem's been with Mr. Hyde. Mm-hmm. So, um, That's, yeah. faced, with, faced with that situation, he's not going to kill an innocent woman. So the only thing that's going to happen is he's going to get blowed up by Manx. Well, Manx is not his favorite person by any stretch of the imagination. It's... I mean, if you're going to go at the hands of somebody, do you want to go at the hands of somebody you hate? Or do you want to go at the hands of somebody you love, somebody you you respect? Mm -hmm. (coughs) It's along the lines of not giving the villain what he wants, which will make him happy. I'm not going to kill this innocent woman, and I'm not going to let you blow me up. Just not going to happen. You're going to be out. You're going to lose on both accounts. Because you can't tell me that if Tychus wanted to shoot, that he wouldn't have shot. He had plenty of time. Yeah. He had his gun trained on Sarah Kerrigan for a good five count before Jim even turns around. And he certainly could have pulled the trigger. If it was only about saving his own life, he could have pulled the trigger and killed them both. But that's not who he is. And I'm watching this scene, and all of this stuff is, like, flooding over me. I'm really realizing this. It's like, whoa, this scene was deeper than I thought. How was I able as an actor to do that if I didn't fully understand it? The only answer I can think of is, must have been that brilliant director. Yeah. So, in in the end, now, I mean, it, it really, I mean, it sounds like you have a lot of insight into the character now. And I would imagine, you know while doing the the voice acting that wasn't the case so do you think now you you actually portrayed that character um as maybe you envisioned back then or is it something completely different but now exactly you know, right it's it's a little bit of both mm-hmm. it's a little bit of both i played it the way i was intending but there are certain it, it, it's kind of like when you paint or when you're in an a cappella group. Um, when you're in an a cappella group, sometimes there are certain notes that can be sung that will not sound like four parts. It'll actually sound like five because yeah. some of the notes, the way they overlap, creates a, a residual resonance, as it were. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of how I feel about what I was doing with Tychus in some of those scenes is like, because the the script was so well written and the direction was so good that I thought I was painting with three colors and without even knowing it, I was painting with four. Mm-hmm. So, you know? So it, it, to me, it, it really looks like um, you, you got immersed into the storyline. Is Was this job for Blizzard um, something something different to you? Is it... Is it maybe I don't know? Was it a highlight in voice acting and acting, or is it was it just like well, any other job? I, I, yes and no. Um, in a certain sense, just like any other job, you know, you walk in unshaven, wearing a pair of shorts, flip flops, and a t-shirt, and you act your arse off, you know. And in other ways, it was different because a lot of the stuff that I've done has been working on other characters that existed at another time Mm -hmm. for someone else, whether it was playing Optimus Prime or playing the Green Goblin or playing Kraven the Hunter or any of that stuff. There was always a point where somebody could look back and go, oh, I remember when this other guy did it. Yeah. But playing Tychus, that was mine. And until they say differently, that's my character. I, I did it. In the, I did it in the scratch tracks. I did it in in Wings of Liberty. I did it on the book. 
Um, Devils Do. Um, sorry, Heaven's Devils. Devils Do I didn't do because they didn't do an audio book for it. Dag nabbit. <laughs> I would love to because I thought Christy Golden wrote a, a wonderful book. Um, and by the way, if you want to know more about Tychus and Jim, pick up uh, Heaven's Devils and Devils Do. And uh, those are a couple of really fun stories. It's kind of like Butch and Sundance, the early days. Yeah. Yeah, the the audiobook is um you know pretty much the backstory of um Tychus and and Jim Rayner. No. When they first meet and then Devils Do is the continuation. Mhm. Okay. Um, so so yeah. you know so basically um at, at this point in time Tychus playing Tychus is my favorite character and my favorite job that I've done to date. Um, I certainly hope that it will that it will be surpassed, or continue, or continue to be surpassed. Um, I'm I'm a middle aged guy, and I'd hate to think that uh, I hit my professional peak, um, you know, halfway through. Yeah. So you would be delighted to continue to work for Blizzard, or maybe even continue to work on a character called Tychus. Is that right? <laughs> uh well. Um, it, there. For all I know, there may be the opportunity to, to do one and not the other. Okay. There may be the opportunity to work for Blizzard and not play Tychus, and there may be the opportunity at some point to play Tychus and not work for Blizzard. Who knows? Um, I'm I'm a workaday actor. Um, I'm not on on any series that's long running. Um, so I've got nothing I can wake up and count on day to day. So each and every day I've got to go out and audition and, and make something happen and book something new and work for a day and leave it behind and move on to the next thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now coming back maybe to, um, to, to the community a little bit. Um, we, we talked earlier about conventions and stuff like that and someone uh, wrote me a message earlier saying he would love to see you at a major tournament of StarCraft 2 um, doing stuff like announcing players um, etc. Well tell them that tell them that I mean you know the, it's, it's, it's nice when you, when you tell your favorite uh, football player that you want him to do you know be an announcer at the World Cup but until you contact FIFA and let them know the brilliant idea. It's not going to happen. We actors don't get to decide that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I would I would I would Robert and I have actually talked about it many times. We think it would be a blast. We think it would be a lot of fun. And so it's just really up to a tournament to uh invite us and bring us in. All right, yeah, we will definitely spread the word. Um, that it's the same sentiment in the chat. Um, they're already suggesting what kind of tournaments and where you should go, etc. Um, so we'll definitely try to spread the word. Um, cool. Thank you. What What other ways are there um to get in contact with you? I mean, you are really emerged in the community. You're doing this for the community. Um, how can people interact with you? Well, I'm I'm on Twitter, kneecap, N E K A P. Um, I'm, I'm very active on my fan page on Facebook, um, which is Neil Kaplan, N-E-I-L-K-A-P-L-A-N. Just look for the fan page, not the personal page. I try to keep those separated. Um, my website's been having some technical issues and hopefully, uh, we'll get those resolved fairly soon. But, um, those two ways people can definitely, uh, keep in touch with me, send me notes, um, ask me questions. I'm there every day, so I, I answer things as best as I can. Alrighty. You know, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, somebody asked me uh, if Blizzard owned the voice of Tychus Finley. Okay. And I, uh, great question. Great place to, uh, to uh, ask it is is on the is on the fan page. And I said, well, they own the character, but I'm pretty sure I own the voice. Actually, um, I, I want to follow up with that a little bit. Um, you know, there was a lot of debate and discussion about um, copyright law with PIPA, SOPA, ACTA, you know. Um, right. As a voice actor, where do you see yourself in this in this debate? Like, what's, what's your personal opinion um, on, on this kind of movement um, on really strict copyright um, laws right now? 
well, you know, I certainly can see both sides of it, and it's and it's kind of tough, but nobody wants the work that they've done to be taken and used and used and used and used without being asked, without being told thank you, or quite possibly if we're talking about a situation where somebody uses your work that you never intended it to be used for, but they use it in a way where they make money. Yeah. Um, I don't know anybody who wants to be taken advantage of like that. Mm-hmm. You know, now, um, that doesn't change the fact that I'm also a big fan of parody and a big fan of creativity. And if somebody can use something that I've worked on um, as inspiration, I like that. Uh, but uh, I am by no means a uh, a one percenter. I'm I'm not a I'm not a movie star. I'm not an Oscar winner um, who demands seven figures a pop whenever I say three words to, together. Um, that being said, I'm. I'm fairly easy to get a hold of, and I'm fairly easy to work with. So I'd love to have all these creative people around the world uh, contacting me and, and, and saying, hey, how can we work together? Instead of, how can I rip you off and better my own life as a result of your efforts? All right, yes. There's, yeah. there's something in that that just doesn't seem right, you know? Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, what are you working on right now? What are some things we can, can be looking forward to? Um, well, the only things that I can tell you about that you can look forward to at the moment, um, uh, Marvel will be releasing the DVD of uh, the Iron Man anime that I worked on. Um, that'll be out in April. Uh, Guild Wars 2, which I've played uh, three lead characters on and may be working on some more characters. Um, I've been told that Guild Wars should be out later this year. I just haven't been given an exact date. And anything else still at this point, I am sworn to secrecy. Okay. All righty, yo. I'm just asking the chat if there are any more questions from the viewers. I think we covered a lot. Um, let's see. I'm just going to have to wait here. Sure. Um, some qu uh, one question is: Can you elaborate on your role in Guild Wars? Um, all I can tell you is I, I play two Char and one Norn, and I've been told by one of the lead writers that I am the only actor, or at least when he told me this, I was the only actor who was cast as two different Char. Um, they um, they really like not to have two members of the same race sound alike uh, in case they run into each other but my characters in fact not only run into each other they have a lot of scenes together um, so that's a real kick in the pants for me because <laughs> that's basically the writer's way of letting me know your two characters are so different we felt comfortable about having them in the same room at the same time <laughs> and and that's a compliment. You, you know, you, you, getting back to a question you asked me earlier, which was if I could tell you anything about rewrites with regards to StarCraft. And, and I'll remind you that Chris Metzen told me the whole game was rewritten. Yeah, I heard because they were so as, happy with you. As a result of them going, oh, this Tychus guy sounds pretty cool. Yeah. You know, I did I did scratch tracks and that's where I first got involved and they liked it I guess so much where they went back and 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 rewrote it. So uh you were asking about rewrites. That's the biggest one I can think of. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um one of the viewer um says um to tell you they all say thank you. The interview has been great and they really enjoyed it and everyone is um agreeing to that and they are asking um for you to give them one more final send-off as Tychus? Sure. Um, well, of course, I, I, I thank you. Um, it's, 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 it's been a blast playing the role, meeting fans, watching people play the game. 
Unfortunately, when I watch them play the game, it's just the battle, so I don't really so much hear any of my work. I just get to see what kind of amazing players they are. And, of course, that that stunning design um, that, that Blizzard gives all of their games. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, you can sit back and watch people play any one of their three games. That's how well designed they are, and I'm glad to be uh, uh, a part of their universe or universes. Um, so I guess we'll just uh, say goodnight to everybody. Have a drink for me, and make sure you sleep tight tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much for this interview. Um, I was, I'm, I'm really glad to, to have you on the show, and um, I hope, yeah, we will do this again. Maybe after Heart of the Swarm comes out, um, we will see. And, yeah, thank you very much. You're very welcome, Jojo, and uh, thank you to everybody who spent some time with us tonight. All right, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>